Hello, we'd like to welcome you to another Engineers Newsletter Live broadcast. The subject today is specifying quality sound, the low cost path to quiet. I'm Art Hallstrom, Trains Manager of Airside Applications Engineering. With me today is Dave Guckelberger. Dave is from the Train Applications Engineering Department in La Crosse and has considerable experience with predictive acoustics programs and will be sharing his knowledge with us. Also with us today is Brian Reynolds. Brian is an engineering technology project leader for TRAIN and has considerable experience with ARI and AMCA testing and rating of equipment. Today's subject, sound and vibration control, is a rather big subject. To keep this broadcast within the available time, we will be focusing today on large air handling system acoustics. In this broadcast, we're going to cover the fundamentals of acoustical modeling. There we're going to talk about setting the acoustical target for the space. What's the right value? We're going to talk about identifying sound paths. We're going to talk about then path modeling or path attenuation. We'll go into an ARI 260P update, which is a new standard under development for ducted sound power. Then we're going to talk about a cost-effective noise control solutions. These are ideas that can help you reduce the cost of a project and incorporate lower sound for the same amount or less money. A case history will talk about an acoustically optimized job where many of these ideas were put together in practice. And finally, we'll have a Q&A session for you to call in or fax in your questions on subject related to air handler acoustics. The case history today will be the Trans-Canada Pipeline headquarters in Calgary, Canada. Uh, this headquarters building is currently under construction as one million square feet and utilized floor by floor air handlers. The target sound level was NC35. The interview will be with Jim Loudon, an executive vice president of the Mitchell Partnership Inc. in Toronto, Canada. His firm designed the building and this building does use these large CFM air handlers and no energy consuming duct silencers. Where can you get more information about sound? Well, all of these broadcasts are tied to engineers newsletters. Newsletters are short and targeted on a specific subject. Dave, could you tell us more about the newsletters tied to this broadcast? Sure thing, Art. I'd be happy to. There are two newsletters accompanying this broadcast. Uh, you may have already received copies of these newsletters. If you haven't, you can pick one up at the train office, or you can down download them directly from our website at train.com. Titles of these two newsletters are Specifying Quality Sound, and the second one is Sound Ratings and ARI 260P. We won't have time to cover all the material in these two newsletters today, so we'd recommend that you review them after the broadcast. In particular, the Specifying Quality Sound newsletter is a valuable resource for the terminology that's used in acoustics. It gives you um, definitions of sound power and sound pressure, tells you how to calculate an RC if you wanted to do that. A bit of housekeeping, you should have been given a handout of the slides that accompany today's broadcast. Uh, we hope that you'll take notes on those. Uh, slides and if you have any questions about the material that we're covering jot them down and fax them to us during the broadcast that'll give us an opportunity to consolidate those questions and hopefully we can get to more of them then during question and answer <clears throat> the first step in predictive acoustics is setting a proper target um, the specifying quality sound newsletter gives you quite a bit of terminology and a little bit of background on setting the target but we're going to have more in the broadcast today and up next Art will be talking about other resources that are available for setting the target. Hi. The first step in establishing a target in uh, designing a quiet system, what are you shooting for? It's been said that the proper background acoustics is the unobtrusive sum of all sounds. The definition of noise is objectionable sound. So acceptable noise or quiet comfort is a space where the occupants don't notice the background sound. It needs to be quiet enough to do the, whatever the application or needs are in the space, but not too quiet. In fact, a good quiet comfort space is one where you might have to point out to the owner that the space is perfect. 
Everyone remembers the noisy hotel rooms, but not the good ones. Ever been in a situation where you've been in a hotel room, you have a choice? You can either leave the air conditioner on, which is quite noisy, and get air conditioning, or you can turn it off and sleep. That's the dilemma. If you have a noisy hotel room, you don't tend to go back to that hotel. If it's a good hotel room, you come back over and over again. That's really the thrust of quiet comfort targets. That's why owners want quiet comfort. How difficult is it to achieve a sound target cost effectively? Perhaps easier than you think. Follow these simple steps. First, find out what ASHRAE recommends for the space. Second, what do the occupants expect compared to the ASHRAE goal? Third, are there any low, uh, laws or codes that apply to the space? And then fourth, what does the budget allow for the space? If all that's in the budget is basically window units, you don't have a lot of dollars available to acoustically optimize the system. What does ASHRAE recommend for the spaces? Well, here are some sample application sound targets. In the 1999 ASHRAE handbook, it defines RC targets for these different applications. Now, previously we were using NC levels and they still apply. Uh, NC and RC are about the same, at least in the 500, 1000 hertz octave bands. It's the RC addresses the extremely low frequencies, 31 hertz, 16 hertz. Uh, that's talked about by acousticians, but in practice, <clears throat> it's very hard to design for a actual RC target. Note the sound levels were 25 to 40, for example, for classrooms. Uh, 25 being a low end, 35 being more typical. Uh, these are again our ranges, and within the ASHRAE documentations, you may find these numbers vary by anywhere from 5 to NC points. Their goals, if you will, not necessarily absolute targets to hit. How do you validate these targets? First, check and also see if there's any local code noise ordinances. What are the maximum limits defined for the application? They might help you set the target. For example, in the state of Washington, there's a requirement that schools be designed for NC35. In fact, in order to get the occupancy permit, an independent sound consultant needs to come in and basically certify the space as being under NC40. In the state of Arizona, they just recently adopted a requirement for classrooms that says the center of the classroom needs to be less than 50 dBA. Now, 50 dBA is a lot louder than NC35, but at least it's a standard that's moving it in the right direction in terms of quiet comfort for a classroom application. The next step in the process is define what the occupants or the owners expect. You know, if they're happy with NC45, you don't need to design for, the, for 35. The lower the sound target, it'll take more work and cost to get to that level. And the lower you go, the less effective the traditional rules for acoustical designs apply. Finally, what's the budget? Again, does it have enough to cover the cost of noise control options? and can you optimize the system effectively. Now we're ready to start designing the job. Ever had the feeling that hitting the sound target is a lucky experience? I'd submit to you that creating quiet comfort does not have to be. Dave, Brian, and I have seen hundreds of jobs that come at the NC level they were designed for. Hitting an NC target does not have to be a lucky event. In fact, I'd like to really show you a truly lucky event. We were able to obtain a film clip of a jet in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Now this fighter is about to pass a naval aircraft carrier. And just as it comes across the aircraft carrier, about 100 feet off the water, it's going to go supersonic. Now, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, there's a lot of humidity. So we're real close to the saturation point on this particular day. As the fighter goes through the shock wave, the transition to supersonic, you'll see a halo form where the shock wave is converting vapor into water. It's quite a unique experience, considering that you have to catch the jet at the right time, the sonic boom has to happen at the right time, and somebody had to keep a camera on this plane. Can we show them the clip, please? There's the plane coming in. See the shock wave off the supersonic right there coming up. It's 
whole sequence only takes approximately four seconds. And in fact, the pilot has to pull the nose up because of the weight shift or he'll be in the drink. Watch the nose go up right there. That is truly a lucky event. Creating quiet comfort does not have to be. Here are the validation steps to establish the correct sound target. Find the accepted NC target. Read up on the subject if you possibly can. Verify the owner and occupant requirements for the space. How rigidly do they want to hold you to that target? And then check the budget. Use the optimization ideas in this video and other magazine articles to help reduce your noise control costs. Let's take a specific subject and explore it a little bit further. A very hot subject these days is classroom NC targets. How low should they go and what's the right level? In fact, it's such a hot article that last month in the ASHRAE Journal, the February issue, they talked about noise in the classrooms. And they specifically addressed the issue of what is the NC target and then they had some helpful select, uh, options as to how to go about achieving it. The key thing is what is the target? The U.S. government right now, for example, the American Disabilities Board has a study going underway. It's a two-year study where they're investigating the issue of classroom acoustics in the area of providing educational opportunities to disabled students. If the sound levels in the classroom are too high, can the disabled students hear the teacher? If they can't hear the teacher, they cannot learn effectively. Uh, this study is due to be completed in the year 2001. Will it change the, uh, or mandate a background sound level in classrooms? We're not sure. The study is not out yet, but it could. And remember, this is the group that gave us wheelchair access for buildings. So they do have the power to institute a requirement. Another thing you can do is take a look at websites. Uh, the ASHRAE Sound and Vibration Committee, TC 2.6, has a public website. And on that website, they have seminar material on classroom acoustics. Now, the seminar was conducted in Chicago on an ASHRAE meeting about 18 months ago. If you go to that website, which is shown at the bottom of the screen, you can listen to different presentations on classroom acoustics. You can also download a spelling test. Now, the spelling test will give you two parts, one part with a, what we call a low background clearance and one part with a high background clearance. You can hear the audibility of the teacher's voice as she's giving the spelling test. This slide here shows what's happening. A teacher's typical voice is between 500 and 2,000 hertz in frequency. It's kind of spiked like the yellow line shown here. The green background line represents a typical background sound. Uh, it has a 3 dB clearance between the teacher's voice and the background sound, and it's spiking out about where her voice is. Uh, typically, that might be diffuser noise in the space. Uh, basically, the diffusers were inappropriately selected for this application. If we were to go back and reselect the diffusers, redesign the ear handling system to get the noise in that frequency down, you would see a curve that looks something like this. That is a 15 dB spread between the teacher's voice and the background sound levels. And that, frankly, is what's being recommended for primary classes in the one to third grade. Let's go ahead and take a spelling test. We brought those two clips down and we've arranged them so there's four words. The first word you hear in the spelling test will be with a 3 dB background clearance. The second word will be the same word but with a 15 dB background clearance. Write down and hear, see if you can identify the words in both cases. The spelling test, please. Number one, fill. Number one. Field. Number two, catch. Number two, catch. Number three, thumb. Number three, thumb. Number four, heat. Number four, heap. I think this simple spelling test might convince people that the need for background sound clearance is important in teaching environments, hotel rooms, and even simply in stores. Uh, how do you find out if a space is good or bad? Well, there's some tools available for you to do that. One of the simplest and most effective we found 
is a simple little sound meter. This is a type 2 sound meter and we call it the TR10 sound meter. Uh, you can set this meter up so that it, when you turn it on you'll see a series of red lights. These red lights are the sound pressure level in the space as measured by this microphone on top of the meter. Small and compact, it's fairly effective in giving you a frequency spectrum as well as the dB level in the space. Uh, the spectrum goes from 16 or 31 hertz up to 16,000. The dB levels are pretty much from 30 dB up to 123. Uh, you can do linear scale or A scale. This meter is very successful, enabling you to determine if a voice could be heard in the space. If you're getting full scale deflection, you're being heard. It also allows you to zero in on the frequency of a noise in the space, and knowing the frequency and the amplitude of that noise can help pin down what the source of the noise is and thus allow you to attack the problem that's generating the noise in this space. In fact, at the last ASHRAE meeting in Dallas, I was stopped by Don Bonfleft of Cincinnati. He's a past president of ASHRAE and an ASHRAE fellow. He made a point of telling me that the meter he bought several years ago was one of the best diagnostic tools he's ever purchased. It's helped him analyze the noise on many jobs. Consider adding a meter like this to your firm's diagnostic tools. Okay, we've set the target now. The next question is to take a look at the path identification. Dave, could you help us out there? Once the target has been set, the next step is to look at how sound travels to the occupied space. We do this with a model that we call source path receiver. In this model, the source is the object that's radiating the sound. The receiver is the li listening location where we're trying to meet the target, and the path accounts for everything in between. Let's look at a case of uh, a conference room located next to an equipment room and show you how the paths would be set up for this particular example. You can see the fan and the equipment on the left-hand side of your screen. The supply air is ducted to the room, there will be sound that comes with that supply air through the diffuser and into the space. Part of that sound that's with that supply air will also break through the duct wall and through the ceiling tile down into the space. That's the su supply breakout path. But sound can also travel opposite the direction of airflow. In this case, there's a short piece of return duct, but it's not connected to the unit. The sound that's radiated into the equipment room, a portion of that sound goes into that return duct uh, up into the plenum space and down through the ceiling tile into the space. That's the return airborne path. And then the last path here is the sound that travels directly through the wall between the two rooms, and that's the wall transmission path. Depending upon the type of equipment you have and the installation, you can have a number of different paths involved, but generally they'll fall into three different categories. The categories are airborne sound, and that's sound that travels with or against the airflow, breakout sound, sound that travels through duct walls, and transmission sound, sound that travels through floors and ceilings. Um, we, can, we can look at this for a, another type of application just to show you how this applies to a different piece of equipment. In, in this case, uh, we'll have a rooftop unit. Again, we're going to have a supply airborne path, sound that comes with the supply air through the diffuser into the space, a supply breakout path, there's a return airborne path. And if you had more return ductwork, you may even have a return breakout path. In this case, the sound that's radiated from the casing of the unit is radiated to the outdoors, but a portion of that sound goes down through the roof and through the ceiling, and that's our ceiling transmission path. It really depends on the type of equipment that you have, uh, how your sound paths will come out. It may be very simple. Um, Important points to remember are that one piece of equipment may contain multiple sound sources. You may have a supply fan and a return fan in the same unit, or there may be compressors or other sound sources in that unit. You also look, have to look for all the different sound sources that may be affecting that space. Make sure that you realize that sound may travel along multiple paths from a particular source to the space. And then finally, it's the sum of all these sound paths that determine the sound level in the space. Sound path identification can be very simple. In the case of a fan coil unit, 
We have a single source. It's located in the room. Um, it's a very straightforward model. Uh, the bad news about that model is there's very little that you can do to attenuate it. It's just a source in a room. Um, what we're trying to do here is just look for all the ways that sound get into the space. <coughs> the reason that you need to look for all the different ways sound gets into the space is that oftentimes people make the assumption that a particular path is going to be the critical path and they'll spend their money applying um, correction to the, just that path and then what happens is a flanking path will hold up the sound level. So it's important to look for all the sound paths. Next up we're going to talk about acoustical prediction modeling. Okay, we've established the target and we've identified the paths. The next thing to do is model the individual paths out to the receiver. This is a fairly straightforward process. It involves five steps. Number one, break down each path into its elements and then calculate the acoustical effect of each element in that path. When you're done, you can add up the sound for that path and then add up the sound for all of the paths together. Compare the sum to the target NC level and if you're high, go back and attenuate the loudest pass, because that will give you the most bang for your buck. How do you do this modeling? Well, fortunately, many ASHRAE projects over the years have provided designers with the equations needed to make these acoustical projections of the elements. Uh, these equations can be linked together in a spreadsheet program or has already been done in one of several commercially available software programs. These analysis tools can help at several phases during the job. It can forecast sound pressure levels during the design process when it's easy to make changes and cost optimize the system. Or it can be done after the fact if you have a problem job because identifying a noisy path on a real job by just simply measuring is very difficult to do. On all of these analysis tools, you need to start with accurate sound data of the source. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. The advantage of uh, sound prediction programs is it gives you the expected attenuation by path. And knowing what path is the loudest allows you to focus the noise control options on the loudest path and then get the most bang for your buck. You can predict what, to some degree of accuracy, how accurate or how much attenuation you're going to get. Once the model's built, you can make the changes and see what the resultant space sound levels are. And remember, start with accurate data. That's a brief overview of acoustical path analysis. Now, unless you're really good with calculators and like doing log functions, we strongly recommend you use the path modeling program, a software prediction program. If nothing, then simply to save you your design time. We'd like to show you one path prediction program that's widely been used in our industry since 1987. Dave, can you give us a tour of the TAP or Train Acoustics program? Yes, sir. I'd be happy to. Um, as Art mentioned, TAP is a general prediction tool that's used for acoustical modeling. <clears throat> it uses the ASHRAE algorithms, and these algorithms um, are available through ASHRAE. The thing that TAP does is put them in an easy-to-use format. I just want to give you a quick overview of the layout of the program, and then we'll go back to our example and look at how we would model the conference room next to an equipment room. I'll just show you on the computer here. The program consists, this is the opening screen. There's a, a path view section at the top. That's where we model each of the paths. In the center, there's a sum view section. That's where we add the paths together. And then the table view at the bottom gives us the tabular data for whatever is highlighted up above, whether it's a path or a sum. Let's go to um, an example now. We'll look at the example that we talked about before, equipment room next to a conference room. We've already identified that there are four paths involved here. To save some time, I've modeled this already, and I'm just going to go and open that file up. You can see here, let me just expand this window. Here's the four paths that we've modeled. Each path starts with the equipment sound data, and then elements are added one at a time that describe the portions of that path. I have the supply airborne selected here. Let me go down and show you in the table view down at the bottom. Table view shows you the tabular data for each of those elements 
And then down at the bottom, it also calculates an NC value. In this case, path one, our supply airborne path, is coming in at an NC 52. After I have all the individual paths modeled, the next thing to do is to sum them together. My sum includes all the paths so far except for path one, so I'm just going to drag path one down and add it to the sum. When I click on the sum view now, it shows all four paths, and the table view shows me the results of the four paths and the total NC for the four paths when they're added together. At this point, what I probably would do would be to go and see how my total compares to my target. So I can plot my total on an NC chart. And let's say the target for this space was NC45. Here's my NC45 curve. And I can see that uh, in every octave band except for 4K, I've exceeded my NC45 curve. And I can see how much in each octave band. At that point, then, I have the information I need to go back and look and see which of the paths um, are dominant. In this case, it turns out that uh, all the paths are players here, at least in the first octave band. To give you an example of what I would do to lower a path, uh, let's go back up to our path one, and I'll just open that straight section of ductwork. It's unlined duct. I'm going to change it to line duct and change, make it two inch lining. Click OK. And now when I go back to my table view, I can see the effect of that. It went from an NC52 down to an NC47. That's a, a very quick overview of the train acoustics program. Uh, it's a general prediction tool through custom elements that can be used with any manufacturer's data for indoor or outdoor applications. Of course, there, there are other prediction tools available. Some of the other tools that are available are general prediction tools like TAP, but some of them have been refined for specific applications. Um, Brian Reynolds is going to give us a little bit more information on a particular specific application program. Brian? Thanks, Dave. The program that Dave is referring to is called CLCHLP. This is a special purpose path prediction program that is only available from the factory. CLCHLP is based on experimental data that was obtained through testing in a mock-up test facility. The picture of the mock-up test facility shows a portion of an office building where th there are two conference rooms immediately adjacent to a mechanical equipment room in which a central station air handler unit is located. The ductwork for the air handler unit goes out over the conference rooms and sound reaches the, sp the space in this mock-up simulation in the same way that it would in an actual office building. You can also see the ceiling slab up above the rooms just the way it would be in the office building. The next slide shows output from the CLCH LP prediction program. The user of the program would describe what the supply path and return path and wall path is for the application that he is trying to model. In this case, we're showing an example of the air handler unit in the equipment room. It has a supply duct that goes out over the conference room. Sound breaks out of the supply duct. Sound from the air handler unit also could go through the open hole return that we're modeling here. And the wall path is a concrete block. Then there's a section of the form where adjustments can be made to the supply duct geometry to make it match exactly what's being modeled. The values shown on the, on the form to start with are the experimental values that were obtained during the testing. Then the output form shows the discharge and inlet place plus casing sound power levels, octave band data from 63 hertz to 8,000 hertz. CLCH LP provides predictions of the sound pressure level inside the equipment room around the air handler unit, and then provides predictions of the conference room sound pressure level determined by the three paths that sound is reaching the conference room. Supply path breakout, return path sound going through the open hole, and sound going through the wall path. Finally, the three separate paths are combined into an overall calculation of combined path sound pressure level with the resulting NC level. The advantage of having this kind of information is that the designer can quickly see which path is critical 
and apply noise control measures to the most critical path. As you, as you can also see, it's very important to start with good quality source data. Unfortunately, there are varying degrees of quality of sound power information for air handler units in the industry today. This slide tries to explain the pedigree of the sound source data, which ranges all the way from generic projections, which are not based on any test data, but are typically using the ASHRAE algorithm method for fan sound prediction that some manufacturers still use. One level of improvement beyond that would be to use an algorithm method for trying to take into account the effect of an air handler unit configuration in addition to just what the fan sound is. A step beyond that, which is commonly used, is to do testing of the fan only using AMPA 300-96. The most accurate method available in the industry today is ARI 260P, which is sound power testing of the ducted air handler unit. Now that we've seen how the, the, that there are different levels of quality of sound power information, the next slide explains how this information is, is being applied today to obtain air handler sound power level ratings. The poorest level of information that's available that, that, we're, that we can still find in the industry is simply using ASHRAE algorithm type methods for predicting the fan, the air handler, and making path projections. One step level better than that for air handler sound would be to get fan tested data in accordance with AMCA 300 and then combine that with an ASHRAE algorithm to predict the sound of an air handler unit configuration. This is a common method that is being used by custom air handler manufacturers. The next step better than that is to use the AMCA 300 method, which is a standard for fans, but apply that to an actual air handler unit configuration. This method is fairly commonly used by manufacturers of catalog air handler units. The best level of sound power level information for ducted air handler sound equipment is to use ARI 260 to sound test the air handler unit and then make path projections for occupied space sound levels based on mock-up test results like we saw in the CLC-HLP prediction program. Both ARI 260 and AMCA 300 are reverberant room sound test methods. Here's a picture of a reverberant room in an acoustics laboratory that gives you an idea of this kind of a facility and the special requirements that, that are needed in order to be able to obtain good quality sound information. Art, now that we've seen the importance of obtaining good quality sound power information, we need to know more about ARI 260P. Sure. ARI 260P is a standard currently under development, and we found a speaker who can give you a quick update on that standard. Rich Harmoning is Trains Manager of uh, Mechanics and Acoustics Technology. He's also been on the ARI 260 subcommittee since its conception. In fact, he's chairing it. Uh, he stopped by to give us a briefing on the ARI 260 standard. He's not able to be here today, so this update was pre-recorded. As discussed by Art and Dave, to be able to predict the application sound pressure levels in the occupied space, we need to know the strength and the relationships between the sound paths from the source to the receiver for each one of the sound paths. In addition, this infers that we need to know actually what is driving each sound path, or in other words, the source, or the sound power level related to each component of the product that is driving each path in the application. Thus, it's not enough to have the total sound power level of the product, as in typical cases. But in this case, we need to have the sound power level for each sound component related to the application-specific sound paths. ARI 260P is a sound standard for ducted equipment that measures these independent sound components of the product source. 
for each one of these application-related sound paths. This is for catalog products, ducted air conditioners, and air handling units. The sound components that we get from ARI-260P are the ducted discharge, the inlet plus casing component, the ducted inlet, and casing radiated. And in some cases, when needed, free inlet and free discharge. Products of, uh, covered under ARI-260P are air conditioning equipment, such as central station air handlers, unitary air conditioners, including air source heat pumps, water source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, including closed loop ground source heat pumps, and fan coil air conditioners that are ducted. ARI-260P is in the final draft stages and is ready for the process of being approved in the spring of this year. If we look at the application that we've seen before, the typical application layout, we see the sound paths again, and specifically I'd like to take a look at how that relates to the source from the product. On the right, we see the sound coming from the discharge duct, whether that's through the diffuser or from duct breakout. Both of those sound paths coming into the room are being driven by the ducted discharge coming from the product. If we look at the wall path coming from the mechanical equipment room into the occupied space, or for, for that matter, the return path coming into the occupied space, both of them are being driven by the sound component, which is the combination of the free inlet and the casing radiated from the product. Not shown in this figure, however, if we had a ducted return situation, the wall path again would be driven by the casing radiated only and not the casing plus inlet. If we look also at obtaining the sound power levels for each of these separate product components, that's important. But also, in addition to that, we need to know what these sound components are at the different operating conditions for the specific application. If you would expect, that gets us into a very detailed and large database of information. To get to that, we use what we call a mapped rating. And I'll get to that in detail in a moment. As you'd expect then, for all this data that we must collect, it becomes a very involved process. And to be able to measure these different components at all these possible application conditions, we take advantage in ARI 260P of the ducted reverberant room technique. This technique takes advantage also of the inherent accuracy of the qualified reverberant room. I'd like to take a look at some of the test setups with you now of the tech uh, the individual sound components that we measure in ARI 260. The first one, as I mentioned before, is the ducted discharge. In this case, we have a setup of a reverberant room and the product, which is outside the room. However, as you can see, there's a duct from the product where we duct the discharge into the reverberant room for measuring the discharge sound. In the second test setup, we're taking a look at the inlet plus casing sound. In this case, we actually put the product within the reverberant room. However, we duck the discharge out. And this way, we're able to measure both the inlet plus the casing radiated noise. In the third setup, we're looking specifically here only for the casing radiated noise. Again, the product is mounted within the reverberant room. However, both the discharge and the inlet are ducted outside the room so that we get only the caserated noise. And finally, if we have a specific case where we need to know the ducted inlet, we then again, as with the discharge case, duck the inlet into the reverberant room to measure that component. For each of these test setups, we measure each of the components across the full operating map of the product as defined by the manufacturer. In addition, if the product has multiple taps, such as a case of a discharge with a discharge plenum and two discharge ducts, each one of those discharges has to be tested independently. ARI 260P also requires that the reverberant room that we're using for the testing is qualified beyond the normal requirements, and we use an ANSI 12.32 qualification 
This qualification is narrow band in nature and takes into account pure tones within the sound spectrum. This is a precision grade measurement. It also employs into ri 260 p the concept of a calibrated reference sound source so that the data that we get from the reverberant room is very accurate. This calibrated reference sound source, the qualified reverberant room and the ducted technique combined with stringent requirements as to how we test this mapped concept gives us a very accurate database. I'd like to talk a little bit more about this map concept. If you take a look at a supply fan map, as we show in this figure, where we have the airflow on one axis and the static pressure on the other, Air I-260P requires that we test several different fan speed curves. These are constant speed curves. And along each speed curve, we take test data at equally spaced points from the stall line, which is far to the left, all the way out to wide open as defined by the manufacturer. There is a requirement on each of these test points that they cannot be any more than 5 dB apart from each other in any one-third octave band. This makes certain that any test data that we develop from this grid of information is very accurate. It is also required that if we are predicting sound levels in between the test points, that they have to be within that map. There is no extrapolation allowed beyond the test speed tested or below the lowest test speed tested. This gets us into, finally, then, another important point. Air I-260P is a ducted reverberant room technique, and it does mimic the techniques used in AMCA 300. However, AMCA 300 is specifically written for standalone fans. Air I-260P goes beyond that and takes into account the effects of the total unit. There are two specific issues related to the effects of the unit that it takes into account that are very important and need to be tested. The first one is appurtenance effects, and the second one is secondary sound sources. Specifically related to appurtenance effects, let's take a look at a figure that shows you a little bit of what I'm talking about. Appurtenances can be anything from modulation devices on the fan, such as inlet guide vanes. It can be downstream or upstream modules or cabinets. It can be coil sections or filter sections, or it can be supply plenums, or even in some cases application elbows or ductwork, as long as they're defined. The key issue that we need to remember in the issue of appurtenances is that appurtenances can add sound to the supply fan or the supply fan component that we're measuring. They can either add sound by flow regenerated noise going through them or actually act as attenuators by attenuating sound on the sound component that we're looking at. The key issue is they must be tested. The second issue that I talked about was secondary sound sources. I think the best example I can give you is a rooftop. Here is an application picture of a rooftop, but I'll give you an indication of what we're concerned about here in ARI 260P. When we're testing the supply fan, whether that's for ducted discharge or the inlet noise or the casing radiated, we must take into account, per Air I-260P, the effects of secondary sources, whether they're refrigerant circuit related, such as compressors, or whether they're other sources, such as condenser fans or exhaust fans. All these can potentially contribute to the sound levels in the product being tested. These two key aspects, appurtenance effects, secondary source effects, the mapped rating concept, and the duct reverberant room that's qualified gives us the basis for being able to put together very accurate predictions for the sound power levels of all the sound components for a product for its different geometries. I'd like to summarize the accuracy of Air I-260P graphically for you. I'd like to give you an example of a case where we do a test on a product per 260p and compare that with techniques uh, used by others when they don't have total tested data. That typical approach is where they will take a fan, sometimes fan tested data, and add to that a cabinet effect. 
that cabinet effect is usually predicted by using classical acoustical equations. They may be uh, non-flow in nature. Even uh, in this case, as we show on the slide, what we have here is a plot of sound power data in octave bands. And in the green or curve that you see here is the ARI-260 test data. And what we have test data for is that figure to the top right, the cartoon of a horizontal supply fan going into two stacked plenums and with a ducted discharge that is actually 90 degrees from the flow path. The green curve, as I mentioned, is the 260 data for that configuration. The prediction in white is the fan plus cabinet effect using an AMCA 300 test for the fan sound power coupling to that a prediction using classical equations. As you can see in this case, depending on the octave band, there can be as much as 10 dB difference between the 260 tested data and the predicted data. Obviously, using a prediction method other than ARI-260P makes, makes it necessary to be for us to put in factors of safety in our calculations when we're doing application predictions to prevent errors in our application sound levels. In summary, ARI-260 has all the requirements necessary to provide us a good, strong foundation for developing the sound power levels of all the sound components for products that is the basis for being able to predict accurately sound pressure levels in the application. We'd like to thank Rich Harming for his update on ARI 260P. Dave's discussed with you the issues of path modeling with generic programs, and Brian's talked about uh, specific path modeling programs that are based on mock-ups and therefore more accurate. If you run through your analysis and you find out the resulting NC value is too high, you're going to need to take a look at some cost-effective noise control solutions that work. These solutions can be located in the path or in the ear handler or both. Frankly, do whatever is most cost effective. We're going to share with you some path noise control ideas and then move on to some equipment source options. First, take a look at the location of the ear handler. Remember that sound, of course, decreases with distance. Uh, don't place the rooftop over a highly sensitive space. Uh, if it's indoor equipment, route the supply ducts over storage areas or bathrooms. Uh, these spaces are generally less sound critical. The noise level will go up in the bathroom, but generally that's not a problem. In fact, you can say it's a productivity enhancement because being louder, people might get out faster. Uh, include the architect on the design team. As you're changing and rerouting ductwork in the building, you may have to coordinate to make sure you got the space to do it. Again, doing it early on helps a lot. Take a look at the wall transmission path. If, the, if you're dealing with an MER wall and it's not strong enough, beef it up. You can add mass or specifically enhance drywall configurations to lower the sound level going through the wall. Seal all the openings. Caulk the cracks. If you see any light through that wall at all, you're reducing the effectiveness of the barrier. And, of course, provide proper vibration isolation under the fans and moving components. Here's a picture of some of the different wall configurations you might encounter. The basic one is a single channel wall with two layers of sheetrock on either side. The extra sheetrock provides a better stiffness and therefore a barrier for low frequency sound. Alternate the seams. So again, you reduce the potential of leakage through the wall in terms of acoustical energy. One step up from this would be a wall that incorporates a resilient clip, sort of a plastic Z on one side of the channel. The good news here is that that Z will float one of the sheetrock walls off the channel, decoupling it. It's a better acoustical wall, but mechanically installing it gives contractors a lot of pain because if they miss a screw and it goes right through the resilient clip and hits the channel, you short circuit out the wall and reduce a lot of its effectiveness. An alternative construction often being used is the one at the bottom. Alternate the studs so every other one hits one of the walls. That way you have no direct coupling of the two walls together. You can add the fiberglass in the middle if you wish, but that's primarily a high frequency attenuator. 
Of course, probably the best wall of all is simply concrete block. It is stiff, and it does tend to stop the low-frequency sounds fairly effectively. Some of the other options you can look at relate to the supply airborne path. I get a lot of questions on duck silencers. So when do I use them? Where do I use them? I'd like to submit to you there is another alternative, and that is a unit-mounted discharge plenum. Discharge plenums are effective on both low and high frequency, to some degree even better than many of the duct silencers. Uh, plenums offer a low frequency reduction because of the end reflection that occurs in the plenum and the reduction of turbulence that occurs in the plenum. High frequency absorption comes from the fiberglass in the plenum. This slide right here shows you the difference between two fan types. I ran this at 8,500 CFM, 3.5 inches static pressure, very typical. It's the fan with a single discharge plenum on the end of it. Notice the difference in the two characteristic curves, the FC fan and the BI fan by themselves. Uh, the FC is generally quieter except in the first octave band. If you add a discharge plenum to both of them, both sound levels drop significantly but the BI fan responds in lower frequencies to the plenum better than the FC fan. And you can see that in this case, the discharge plenum offered the BI fan about a 5 dB reduction at 63 hertz and about 10 dB at 125 hertz. That's very significant and can be a key part of source optimization. Other things you can do is line the internal of the ductwork. Uh, line the inside of the ductwork one or two inches of fiberglass out about 30 feet if that's allowed and approved by the parties to be. Another choice is use duct silencers. But be careful in applying duct silencers. They should be applied generally in the mechanical room wall and be very careful applying silencers to FC fans. Silencers increase the static pressure of the system and on FC fans will increase the noise level of the fan. It, uh, silencers will take out the high frequencies and you may end up with an FC fan using a silencer of ending up with a more rumblier unit than when you started. Be careful. What can you do for the return airborne path? Well, there's a couple alternatives available here. The most popular and easiest to do is simply blow a hole in the mechanical room wall and let the air come into the room. It also has the worst performance in terms of acoustics because all the sound will leak out. You have a 90 degree elbow as a possibility a 90 degree elbow with a T connection over the occupied space, and finally a line chase wall, which is the most expensive but offers you the best performance. Let's take a look at each one of these alternatives briefly. The open hole in the wall is simply a poor alternative acoustically. It's cost effective, but the sound will leak out through the MER into the occupied space. One level better is to add a line 90 degree elbow. This is a 90 degree turn Keep the velocities in this elbow below 1,000 feet per minute. Each leg, if you can make it, should be about four to five feet long to make sure you break up any line of sight sound trying to get through the elbow. The next level up would be a 90 degree elbow with two of them. Basically a 90 degree elbow in the mechanical room followed by a T out over the occupied space. Uh, if one elbow is good, two is better. When you split the duct, try to make those legs about four to five feet out to disperse the noise over a wider area and thus get better performance out of this device. Uh, remember, keep your velocities under 1,000 feet per minute. The last option is the line chase wall. Basically, this is built inside the mechanical room. Uh, you have three layers of 5 8 inch sheet rock on the MER side, two layers of sheet rock on the room side. It's an enclosed box two inches of fiberglass on the inside. Uh, sounds forced to go up through this line chase and out over the occupied space. The line chase wall offers you return air attenuation, plus it stiffens up the MER wall considerably, thus enhancing the wall's resistance to low frequency sound penetrating it. The basic rules of thumb for line air chase walls, depth no more than 14 inches in depth, a thousand feet per minute, and any given line air chase wall should be no bigger than 10 square feet if you want to block most of the 125 hertz noise. Uh, this is an engineer looking at a lined air chase wall actually installed in a mechanical room. Note that the uh, MER, or the lined air chase wall, takes up relatively small footprint inside the mechanical room and is thus favored on floor by floor air handling applications. Let's take a look now briefly at the source. The source is the air handler. What can you do there? Well, solutions fall in one of three categories. 
Take a look at the fan type selection. Take a look at the air handler configuration. Once you pick the fan, can you reconfigure the air handler to take advantage of stacking and turns and multiple discharges? And then finally, look at the unit casing. And is there anything you need to do to the casing to enhance its acoustical reduction of noise at the source? Some of the fan types available to you in the higher end catalog products are basically five or six types. The basics are your double wheel, du uh, dual inlet, double wheel type fans, your forward curve, your BI, and your airfoil fans. Uh, BIs are good in lower frequencies if you have discharge plenums. Airfoils are quite good at higher CFMs. Another fan type often selected is plenum fans, uh, sometimes called plug fans. Key thing here is to make sure that you provide the proper spacing around the fan so it treats the air gently as it goes through the fan. Also take a close look at your blade count on the fan. You want static lift off these fans, not velocity lift. So the more blades you have, the more gently the fan will treat the air. 11 or 12 blades are recommended for acoustically sensitive applications. The last fan type available in these products is your hybrid vane axials. These are your premium acoustical performance fans. Uh, typically, they have very tight tip clearances and designed to treat the air in a straight through forward fashion. Uh, they're characterized by extremely low inlet sound levels as well as discharge sound levels. Uh, these products are available today in both horizontal and vertical configurations, which is something fairly new. In the vertical configuration, you get the advantage of the vane axial type fan, but you also get a footprint for the unit it's about the size of a plenum fan. In this picture here, we're showing one of the vertical configurations. The air comes through the inlet, which you're looking into, drops to the floor, is accelerated through the fan in a vertical plane, and is discharged into a discharge plenum above the unit. You can tap off that discharge plenum and go any direction you want to go. Uh, these units today are available typically in the 15,000 through 30,000 CFM range, and by putting two fans in parallel, twinning them, you can go from 30,000 up to 60,000 CFM floor by floor systems. What about casing construction? Frankly, this is one of the questions we probably get the most. What casing options should I use for my air handler? Well, it depends on if you're dealing with discharge airborne sound or radiated breakout sound. If you're dealing with discharge airborne sound, insulation does have an impact. This chart here shows the effect of insulation in a discharge plenum in a typical air handler. Uh, the yellow line at top, the orange line, shows a solid double wall lining. So you see that the sound going out of the unit is relatively high, basically unlined air handler. If you add one inch of fiberglass, you get a fairly good pull down above 500 hertz. Add two inches of perforation or two inches of insulation, you get even additional pull down primarily in the 500 hertz area. Four inches of insulation, additional pull down the 250 hertz area. If it's important to get the 250 hertz down, four inches is the right route to go. But consider the cost of the casing options relative to the source options we talked about earlier when cost optimizing your system. In terms of cost effective noise control, some simple guidelines are in order. Number one, the earlier you start, the more options you have. Back in the design phase, it's very easy to cost optimize the system. Second, model the lowest cost design first. Why not start with the simplest and the cheapest? And then locate the critical paths, then model the alternatives or the options you need in order to get the source and the path down to the right levels so that you achieve your acoustical target. What I'd like to do next is uh, basically we've covered a lot of ground. And what we'd like to do next is have you hear how one engineering firm designed a sound sensitive Class A office space and achieved the NC35 target they were looking for. Jim Loudon, the Executive Vice President of the Mitchell Partnership, Inc. in Toronto, Canada, has offered to come in and share his experiences with the Trans-Canada Pipeline Headquarters Project in Calgary. As you're listening to the interview, listen for how the design team established the acoustical design criteria determine the importance of hitting the target, design the job, then optimize the job with the construction team, and they even ran a full-scale acoustical mock-up on this project. Jim was unable to be in here in our studio today, so this interview was pre-recorded. Hi, welcome to our interview with Jim Loudon. Uh, Jim, welcome to Engineers Newsletter Live broadcast. 
Glad to be here, Art. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way down from Toronto to share your time with us. My pleasure. Uh, Jim's been coordinating a project called TCPL, which I believe is an office building in Calgary, Canada. Could you tell us something about it? TransCanada Pipelines is Canada's largest oil and gas uh, distributor. They elected two years ago, approximately, to build their, to have built their own head office building in Calgary, approximately a million square feet, 35 stories high, and they began the process by dealing with a develop, developer with whom they could not eventually agree as to cost. Here's a picture of the building presently under construction as put together by TCPL tenants' new developer, landlord H&R Properties. H&R retained PCL Construction, Canada's largest general contractor, to build the building generally to the specifications prepared by the TCPL team. PCL decided to assemble the project as a design build. We, the Mitchell Partnership, are not terribly experienced with design build, so this was a new kind of uh, game for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the design team included an architect in Calgary named Kohas Evami and Partners and structural and electrical consultants. We have offices in both Toronto and Calgary and the electrical and structural people are in Toronto and in one case Calgary. Um, the uh, team put together a package that uh, met pretty much the requirements of the original package assembled by the original developer and TCPL. And then uh, T PCL Construction established the price and came to an agreement with TCPL. Where did sound come into the picture? What was the expectations? The specification, TCPL's original specification, called for NC35 in most of the spaces surrounding the compartmental room. Compartmental room being a air handling unit room in the core of the building. The arrangement of the design, fortunately we were closely working with the architect early in the project, was that uh, compartmental room abutted the men's and women's washrooms and it was possible to take the supply air duct out of the compartmental room over top of the washrooms, which acoustically was a great benefit to the project. The remaining space in the washroom ceiling then became the return air plenum going back into the compartmental room. Okay, so you start then with a compartmental unit that's basically an air handler that has certain features with it. It's a really quiet air handler. The compartment concept is one that the Mitchell Partnership has used for some 30 years. It's uh, effectively a makeup air unit on the roof supplying air down through the building to compartmental units that handle the cooling load. The unit consists of a fan of variable capacity, a chilled water coil, filters, and usually rather substantial inlet and outlet silencers to defeat the noise of the fan. So source attenuation at the source if you, you have will. it exactly. Okay. The um, progress of the project after the price was established was that the mechanical and electrical trades, all the other trades were contracted and uh, we worked together with them to finalize the documentation of the uh, mechanical systems. They brought in quite early in the project, the train company, as the selected supplier of the compartmental units. So this is where you assembled the team of people to be working on the project? You have it exactly. One of the things that PCL believes very strongly in as the leader of this project is a initial partnering session. In this case, they took us all out to the mountains of beautiful western Alberta and to a lodge where we, uh, uh, this team included all of the design functions, all of the contractors involved, and the uh, TCPL people as well. And the objective was to outline how everyone could work together to the maximum benefit of all that all of the arrows were pointed in the same direction, as it were. Sound like a, a getting acquainted bonding experience? It certainly was, and it's very effective. Very good. Extremely. 
So the, so the project got started then, and the, what was unique about this particular project in terms of design? The, we got early assistance from the train company. This 30,000 CFM unit, that was the size of the particular unit, was the biggest thing that the Mitchell Partnership's ever been involved in, and, and we were deeply concerned about the sound that would be generated. The train approach was to say the source of noise is the motor that drives the fan, and the motor that drives the fan is, produces noise in relationship to its horsepower. Anything we can do to reduce the horsepower reduces the noise generation, makes the life of everyone easier. The uh, silencers have quite large resistances to airflow. So therefore, their first step was to remove the silencers and uh, assemble the package and see how it would perform. We usually insist on a mock-up in the uh, specification and uh, sure enough there was a mock-up constructed by you, the train company, in just outside the office of uh, the train company in Calgary in the parking lot. Uh, a little aside is that the adjacent uh, neighbor to the parking lot was a wrecker who uh, crushed cars at uh, odd hours and uh, therefore limited the ability to sound test the equipment. The um, mock-up, however, was irreplaceable. It, uh, it uh, allows you to install the unit and then make whatever adjustments are required to ensure that the NC35 level upon which TCPL insisted was achieved. The uh, uh, modifications that were gone through in perhaps uh, uh, two months, three months it was of, uh, of months. testing, yep. um, achieved the objective to the, to the astonishment, I think, of all of us without silencers on either the supply or return. A couple of the key things were the architectural change early on to route the supply and the return ducts over the mechanical room to let them release their breakout energy into the bathroom itself. Precisely. The, the, the fan discharges out over the washroom ceiling and then splits to the east and west out, uh, over the, out of the core. The space that remains is the return air plenum. I think some of our viewers would be interested in the issue of how important was it to meet NC35? Did the owner know what NC35 was? It's difficult to say whether any owner slash tenant recognizes what NC35 means. Typically, the tenant has been exposed to sound levels that are remarkably higher than NC35 and knows that he doesn't want that the next time. So he uses NC35 because he's been told that that's a effective. good thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And then it's up to the design team to go ahead and make sure that actually happens. Precisely. Were there any sound consultants or acoustical consultants brought on board? The design team retained a fellow named Cliff Fazer, who's a private uh, sound consultant in Calgary. The TCPL people fearing that 35 could not be achieved, retained a consultant from San Francisco. And of course, the biggest contributor was the train company, who uh, rigorously tested, retested, and made the necessary adjustments to ensure that the mock-up worked. But the key thing was, the in that particular sound-sensitive job, it was the team approach of experts working together that contributed to the end project. Precisely, yes. And doing it early on in the project, too. Essential. Do you require mock-ups on every job? We uh, ha have been involved in compartmental air handling systems for approximately 30 years. In the initial stages, we always insisted on mock-ups. After the 10th uh, or 11th time you've used the same unit, you don't need to test anymore because you know exactly how it performs. In this case, the unit was 30,000 CFM somewhat larger than anything we dealt with before and we had to have a mock-up. In retrospect, it would have probably been a disaster to not have a mock-up. Where do you see uh, acoustics headed? You know, you've, you've been uh, the industry, you know, watched over the industry for a few years. 
is acoustics becoming a uh, requirement or is it is it uh, more rigorous I'm trying to say I think the um, typical tenant is becoming more selective uh, more demanding of all sorts of little things related to mechanical systems and acoustics is definitely one of them yes I think acoustics will become increasingly important in years to come uh, any others that come to mind that they're demanding indoor air quality indoor air quality is definitely one temperature control is probably the biggest one they insist where they used to not mind having the thermostat a couple offices down they want it in their office today ah zone control zone control is room control is what they're after okay well thank you for sharing some of your secrets of success with us here today thank you very much thanks for Pleasure coming to in be here come back again thank you we'd like to thank Jim Loudon for coming by and sharing that successful job with us in review of today's broadcast we can talk about key, three key things number one set the acoustical goal for the project make sure the entire team agrees at the outset on the target Second, verify that the budget and schedule will allow you to do the noise control or source optimizations needed to hit the target. Perform an acoustical analysis using some of the design tools that Dave and Brian talked about. Uh, you can use in-house acoustical consultants in addition to supplementing your team, or for complex and critical sound jobs, uh, consider outside consultants. Finally, optimize the path and source as a complete system because they do interact and affect each other. Also take a look at reviewing the acoustical effects when you're building the job. Uh, there's ideas once the design is locked, you might run into issues of cost cutting or sometimes called value engineering. Uh, these items can inadvertently take out the noise control options you work to put in. Make sure they stay in the project. Adhere uh, to the design details during the installation. Make sure that what you design goes in that way. Uh, sticking a post right off a fan discharge and then rerouting the duct around that post mechanically works but acoustically frankly it's often a disaster and then finally confirm the design success as you have successes and you will incorporate those successes into your next jobs what are some of the tools for learning more about acoustics we covered a lot of material today we'd like to share with you a few of the items that you can take a look at after this broadcast one is the train acoustics and air conditioning applications manual uh, available it's a basic document that talks about db sound levels covers the basics of acoustics in a simple easy to read format next the practical guide to noise and vibration control for hvac systems written by mark schaefer and available from ashray publications this forty five dollar or so book is chock full of drawings and illustrations and pictures and helpful hints of how to design a quiet comfort system Third, take a look at the ASHRAE Handbook. The 1999 version has a section on sound and vibration acoustics. It's a rather in-depth discussion, but it is considered basically the Bible of the industry. Some of the other things you can look into, train acoustics program, TAP. There are CDS training courses available for that program. And then finally, of course, check the internet. Uh, there's some websites. Uh, one of them is ASHRAE TC 2.6 public website showing the address on the screen. That was the one I mentioned where you can get the classroom acoustics seminars. Another good source of information is the National Council of Acoustical Consultants website. Uh, this is a council of acoustical consultants that are independent and uh, have expertise in this field and also often involved in sound sensitive, super sound sensitive applications. Uh, when you're looking for a sound consultant from NCAC, uh, make sure that they're working in the field of HVAC acoustics. Acoustics is a broad field. Some of them specialize in airport acoustics, etc. You are looking for the ones that are in HVAC. With that, that completes our broadcast. And now we'd like to open it up to Q&A questions. If you have any questions, please fax them in or give us a call.